Dear friends, thank you so much for being here with us. And today we continue with our part two on the science of self-discovery. Our topic tonight will be, where are we? And this is how to help develop the sense of psychological self-observation. Certainly, this is crucial because we are always hearing this. Uh, remember thyself. Uh, we have to be able to observe our thoughts. But just like when it comes to the to topic of studying, you know, just like everyone expects us to know how to study and do well in school, and yet there is no such a thing as a class that teaches you how to study, well, something very similar happens with this sense of psychological self-observation. How do you know? <laughs> so here, we're going to be addressing that. And in that light, what is this psychological self-observation? Well, I don't believe that we can put it any simpler than this. Psychological self-observation is clairvoyance. Psychological self-observation is indeed conscious imagination. And in our current state, well, we have it a little bit atrophy today. But Samael tells us everyone is more or less clairvoyant, just as everyone is more or less imaginative. So what is it that we must do? We have to work a little to develop this faculty of objective imagination. In the condition that we find ourselves today, most people tend to think in terms of concepts. They think in sentences. As they think and they quote-unquote analyze within uh, the realm and the spectrum of the mind, they tend to have conversations where they ask themselves things like, what happens if I do this? And if I do that, what? And what are people going to think? And it turns out into some kind of mental chatter. But when we're thinking in terms of clairvoyant ability, what we start seeing are images. And the image itself is so powerful because just as you can invoke or evoke a mental image right now, the moment that you create that image within the screen of your mind, you will see that that image comes completely loaded with sensations, perceptions, emotions. The same thing happens with the faculty of clairvoyance. The moment that you spontaneously see the thing, you just get it. You just know exactly what the thing is about. And that is the degree of comprehension that we need. But notice that we use the key word spontaneous. And we have to learn to receive those messages that come to us spontaneously. Because we have some bad habit. And the thing is, is that whenever we are trying to concentrate and meditate and we see that image, what ends up happening is that sometimes we say, uh, I don't think I like that, or that can't be it. And I'm not expecting it to look that way. The moment that we do that, we have automatically corrupted that thing that has been given to us spontaneously. So we have to develop our ability to learn how to listen. Because as we calm ourselves down and we open ourselves to these clairvoyant imagery, the moment that the image shows up, there is no judgment. There is only observation. And with it, then there is the ability to apprehend the true meaning and the true teaching that exists behind it. <clears throat> so now that we have said that this sense of psychological self-observation has to do with clairvoyance, then we have to connect that ability we have to connect into that our need to learn how to listen and to embrace the concept of spontaneity and bring all of that together as a good receiving element for our worst circumstances. 
our mind not only has to be receptive, meaning we have to stop putting so many projections out there and judgments and blocks of fear, etc., etc. As we make it available to receive, then we have to make it capable of receiving our worst circumstances. But we have to then be very watchful on how is it that we are handling every time that we're dealing with these worst circumstances. And we guess that the litmus test that you could put yourself through is to ask yourself the question, when I am facing the difficult circumstances, is my attitude that of, oh, worst circumstances or yay worse circumstances because it is likely that it is more the former than the latter so we have to look at these difficult circumstances in life just as an opportunity we have to really learn to see them as an opportunity for discovery and the least that we rebel against the difficult moments and circumstances in life, the more fruitful the circumstances themselves become. Because in all of these difficult moments, all of our egos start emerging spontaneously. The thing is, is that as they come and go, we tend to just become overwhelmed by the many sensations that we that go through our physical body. And you know very well what these sensations are, because when you're angry, you can feel those butterflies in your stomach. You can feel the coldness in your hand. You can, in many instances, people feel the rage that builds within. And just like when we're fearful, we can feel the shaking in our knees, the inconsistency in the pattern of thought, the difficulty to articulate the word. So as all of this is happening, as part of the instinct that we spoke of in our previous lecture, of that ability just to create a temporary stop so that we can observe, we need to make sure that we can maintain our composure. And maintaining the composure means that even though the body is going, is about to start feeling all of these chains of physical sensations, we have to be willing to observe what exactly is happening at that moment in our thoughts. What is happening within our emotional center. How is it that our habits are getting affected? We have to observe, are there survival impulses that are about to emerge here? Because all along, what is happening is that the creative power that exists within your sexual center is being dramatically depleted. Friends, it has been said that whenever we allow ourselves to explode in a bout of anger, and perhaps you have had some experience dealing with your anger throughout your life, it has been said, perhaps in a joking way, that every time that we explode in a bout of anger, we consume enough energy to be able to feed power to a small town for a good deal of the day. And perhaps that is a little bit exaggerated, but you also know how much force and power go into those bouts of anger. So now that we know about embracing spontaneity, now that we know about the need for the faculty of clairvoyance, now that we know about setting all of these things in a way that is receptive so that we can assume a better attitude towards our most difficult circumstances, where do we start? In our current situation, we find it sometimes difficult to go out and, and, and decide where is it that we can initiate our efforts. And just like any, any hunter who chooses to just go after more than one prey, we usually come back empty-handed. We start working with something, we get distracted, we go after something else, and at the end of the day, it is not much progress that we have made. So a good place for all of us to start. Pick one of these. Observe your anger and stick to it. Or... Choose your pride and look at the many different faces of pride, whether it is your self-love or your self-consideration. 
whether it is your vanity, whether it is that aspect of pride that is seeking to, inc to incite desire in the opposite sex. It doesn't matter. Pick one. Or pick your lust. And somehow says, dedicate two months to every defect. And two months appears to be a long time but the fact of the matter is that uh, there are many students who have been in Gnosis for 5, 10, 15, and maybe 20 years. And because they have not changed the way of thinking, the progress that they have made has been very limited. So time should not be a limiting factor for us. Time will continue to flow. And its force will continue being responsible of linking all of our events in a sequence so that we can somehow retrieve them afterwards with the use of our memory. So pick one, anger or your pride or your lust. And dedicate two months to observing how in those difficult moments, how your thoughts get affected, how your emotions get affected, how your habits your survival impulses, your sexual creative power suffers a consequence. And know that every time that a difficult circumstance arises, instead of rebelling against it, instead of being fearful of it and trying to avoid it, just allow it to flow. Remember that it will pass. And remember that it has been written in the great arcanums, the metals are tested by fire, and man, by the words of those who praise him or criticize him. So allow yourself to go through those tribulations of fire. Go through them with humbleness, serene, with kindness. See them take place. Extract the learnings. Allow them to pass and emerge on the other side with a conviction that that deeper comprehension that you have on your defect, that all that is left of you to do is to invoke of the power of your Divine Mother and ask of her to turn that defect into cosmic dust, and she will do it. But there is a word of warning, because in everything that we do, based on our, on our current condition, we are prone to make some mistakes. So as you receive this teaching, keep this teaching within its own orbit. And Samayel, to explain to us uh, how, how is it that we can best do this, he uses both the examples of fire and water for us to be able to understand. And Samayel tells us, the fire is very useful in the kitchen. In the kitchen, we can use it to cook our food, and it helps keep us nourished. But whenever the fire moves from the kitchen into the living room, we start seeing problems. The same thing happens with water. Water in the bathroom is phenomenal to help us clean ourselves. But the moment that we accumulate three or four inches of water in the house, we know that we are dealing with problems. So let's keep all of these things within their respective orbits. Because sometimes as we start practicing and putting this doctrine into use, the shock of consciousness that we receive is so intense that it starts building up on our faith. And yesterday, we spoke about the faith of clarity, that faith that comes to us when we start getting clarification on the many questions and doubts that we had about so many things and that Gnosis, by its own definition, just answers for us. The moment that we start going past that and we start going into the full practice, the development of our faith starts evolving and that faith starts becoming more tangible. And as that happens, many of our own values, we, we, we may refer to them as virtues, but indeed they are just positive values. In our, uh, in, in our longing or, or, or internal movement just to go out and help someone, we start lecturing them. We start telling them what is it that they must do. How is it that they must deal with their children, with their husband, with their problems in life. And we tend to forget 
that knows this is very individual and very particular. That what works for you is not necessarily going to work for somebody else. And when it does, the way in which these experiences are digested internally, remember, digested and assimilated, is certainly different. So our positive values, they can cause harm. And you may find yourself just going after a friend and telling them how is it that they are doing something and how is it they could do it better. And before long, even with the best of intentions, we could be nudging people out of the opportunity of receiving this wisdom themselves. The moment they feel overwhelmed, they're going to reject it. So we have to keep our experiences within their respective orbit. And that orbit is internal to us. Those orbits are within our own internal microcosmos. And we have to continue being observant, continue being reflexive, continue making use of those exercises of retrospection so that every day we can weigh exactly how we handle things and where is it that we gave away an opportunity that perhaps may not come back in a long while. Speaking about this topic of keeping things within their orbit, in Buddhism, there is a story about a series of monks who at some point uh, were being threatened by the many soldiers of the Chinese army as those uh, tragic events unfolded in Tibet back in the 1950s. And these monks, under the teaching of the doctrine of loving compassion, of kindness, as these soldiers broke in, they started creating havoc, destroying, pilferaging, and in many cases, bringing harm to the nuns of the temples. And what they chose to do, rather than raising their arms and taking a firm stand in that balance between mercy and justice and grabbing their swords or their weapons and fighting back these soldiers, they chose to remain in their meditations and in their considerations. They were asking for forgiveness for those soldiers because they did not know what they were doing. They were asking for divine mercy for those soldiers so that they would stop. But they didn't. And we share this because perhaps within that external experience, we have an opportunity of making it our own. Because there are many times that as we receive the wisdom of Gnosis, we know that we have to go through a radical change. And we know for a fact that as our mental processes change, that we seek to achieve higher levels of being. And as we do that, we have to remain very watchful that we do not polarize ourselves with either the side of justice or the side of mercy. Have you ever given money to a beggar? We had a close friend who spent uh, many months out in a foreign country. And in one of those instances, as he was walking around in one of the local markets, he came across to see that there was a lady who was carrying a baby and she was crying, pleading for people's kindness and charity. And people were just walking past her and not giving her anything. We saw our friend approach her and pull out some coins out of his pocket and give them to her. And he continued moving forward with a weird sensation of satisfaction. He shared later that the sensation of satisfaction that he was experiencing was not the satisfaction that comes from helping an ailing soul, but a satisfaction that comes from a sensation of superiority. A few days later, as our friend was walking the area again, he came across the same woman, crying in the same way, 
walking around with the same baby, asking for more of the same coins. And it took him just a little bit more of observation to notice that the baby that she was holding was not indeed a real baby. It was a doll. And as he just continued observing, as he shared, he noticed how what appeared to be the woman's husband came about a bit later. And her crying and her suffering stopped. And she retrieved some coins and they put them together in a little can and they walked away. When we polarize ourselves with the side of mercy, we blind ourselves and we become complacent with delinquency. When we polarize ourselves in the side of justice, we become cruel and despots. And we may claim that we are changing our lives with the teachings of Samael and, and going through a radical transformation because of Gnosis. And yet, we may end up seeing that we are intolerant with our wife or our husband, with our children. That we become very critical of our parents, of our friends. So we need to keep all of this experience within our own internal orbit. And when it comes to sharing your experiences, remember that these experiences are esoteric. They're meant to be occult. Just like the Buddha sits down and in contemplation awaits for the voice of the innermost. The Buddha shares his teaching only after going through a profound depth of experience. Just because we're getting a little experience here and a little experience there. That should not be an encouragement for us to be sharing everything that we do. Because as we do that, we may find that we are mistakenly awakening greed or envy or ill will in others. So the key here is to live life and to live life in a way that is above everything else, completely honorable. Somehow shares with us a beautiful anecdote and he tells us to keep things in perspective Let's not be like the priest who walks into a brothel and tries to convert people in the midst of the action. <laughs> you see, let's not do that. As we are embracing this internal transformation, let's make sure that we are doing it in a way that it is our actions, the ones that are constantly speaking. And in that light, as you are holding that self-observation, observe your individual temperament. Because all of these things, they start attracting into our lives uh, the things that correspond with them. And your temperament may be somehow sanguineous. And sanguineous means that you would have a strong tendency to anger. <laughs> it's likely that if you are one of those of the, of, of the nature of, of, of Sagittarius or Leo or Aries that are zodiacal signs of fire, it is likely that uh, if you don't keep your anger in check, you may be saying things that you will certainly regret and that things will escalate very quickly. So we have to be willing to understand what is our temperament. And it may appear trivial, but when we have a good feel for what our temperament is, we start operating in a way that is more intelligent. And then it becomes easier for us to see what are the external triggers that put into motion those internal reactions. The same thing happens if your temperament is of a nervous kind. If you feel uneasy, if you feel uncomfortable, if you are more of an introvert and you find yourself in difficult situations that make you feel out of place, that has to be observed as well. What if you're cold? And in that coldness, you don't seem to respond to the things that are happening around you. There is value behind understanding that. And same if you happen to see yourself as being aloof. Where people find it difficult to connect with you. Not because we're asking of you to go out and just start trying to please everyone. 
but so that you can see how is it that your temperament is conforming to the situations that happen around you and how those circumstances around you create an influence. Dear friends, as we go through this, it is likely that you will start asking yourself, am I doing this right? Am I making progress? Are things going the way that they should be? And if those questions exist within you, we must say, great. That means that something is truly working because the abominable and the perverse, they don't see the consequences to their actions. Samael says, whenever you think that you're doing really well in these studies, you're doing wrong. You're doing bad. And he says, and whenever you think that you're doing really bad, those are the days that you're going, that you're doing really well. And it is important that you feel it, that you experience that. Because those who don't, they're usually the abominable and the perverse. They are unable to see the consequences of their very same actions. And they see themselves as just. They see themselves as if they are always on the right and people just do not comprehend them. For them, it is always very simple to be, always, to be able to point the finger and say it is always somebody's fault. It is always someone else who is ungrateful. They always feel they are being shortchanged. They are always being uh, accused. And that consistency on thinking that they are always right. That has to trigger an internal guttural reaction that comes sourced directly out of the consciousness so that they can experience that they are indeed in the wrong. For the most part, they are unable to experience that. So if you are asking yourself, how am I doing? Is this going the way that it should be? Can I be doing better? <laughs> What's going on? Then you, dear friend, are having the right reflections. And it is then, and only then, that all you must do is invoke the power of your innermost. Ask for that guidance and that comprehension. Set yourself in a relaxed state so that you can embrace that spontaneity. So that you can receive through that faculty of clairvoyance, that intuit that will naturally come to you and reveal to you those things that up to that moment have remained occult. So hold fast onto the teaching. And as you start developing your faith, as that faith starts building itself towards that end condition of being unshakable, just make sure that you are consistent with your exercise that you are consistent with the application of the practice. Because if you don't put these things into practice, this all becomes useless. Our knowledge in this gnosis, it has to go beyond comprehension. We have to be able to experience, to apprehend the wisdom that comes from the, from the experiential knowledge itself. The plain knowledge of the doctrine, it doesn't do anything for us. We have known of many people who received this wisdom and after years they read the books and they dominate it in such profound ways. They can lobby any question and they can refer you to specific pages and books where you can find the answers, but they never put it into practice. And if we don't put it into practice, then there is no change. The goal is not to become a library. The goal is to make all of this wisdom conscious and incarnate it. Because that is the only way that we're going to be able to break ways with this scientific and philosophical curse that we have been living on for so long. This philosophical curse that has to do with the loss of the superior senses, with the inability to be able to travel across the airs of mystery, with our inability to create direct influence over the forces of nature. We have to maintain a balance between knowing and being. And that means study, but that also means practice. 
and we must do both. So now that we know this, when we are observing, observation and self-observation have different connotations when it comes to the spiritual work that we are seeking to perform within ourselves. Observation by itself is akin to a centrifugal force. It is something that we project towards the outside so that we can perceive the causes, the conditions, and the effect of the phenomena. When we are speaking about self-observation, we are taking that force and we are bringing it inboard. So observation is centrifugal and self-observation is centripetal. And we say that because the physical senses have very little to no purpose when it comes to self-observation. It is true that the brain does not know the difference between what is inside and what is outside. And because of that, it is true that as you drive that self-observation inboard, as memories are evoked by the mind and you re-experience them, that the brain, not knowing what is happening, it will trigger the same responses in the physical body. And as a consequence, you may be doing retrospection and revisiting that angry moment during the day and see once again the adrenaline flowing through your veins. This is all true. But let's take advantage of the internal sensations and not confuse them with the physical senses. Let's respond to those guttural reactions that we experience, but let's not confuse that with the sense of touch. And as we go then into this idea of self-observation, we know for a fact that the scientific model is indeed extremely practical that it relies on observation to the degree that our good friends, scientists in quantum physics, they are already starting to speak in the very same language that the ancient religions have always spoken about. And they say, the observer cannot be discarded. They say, there is a source of consciousness that has an effect in the actual experiment. And those of you who have heard anything about the double slit experiment know this very well. In that marvelous situation where those scientists, they realize that at a subatomic level, those entities behave both as a particle and as a wave at the same time. And that the only thing that was different was the presence of a conscious observer. So the same thing happens within. The moment that we start observing we take that rhetorical quantum wave within us and we collapse it and we start seeing the true connections between causes and effects. But when we are doing that process of internal self-observation, let's try to just give this a little spin because today we seem to be a little confused. And then as we are trying to do self-observation, uh, Somebody says, keep uh, the remembrance of self, and then we imagine seeing a picture of ourselves as if it were some kind of high school portrait. And that is, that is not what we mean. We have to break with our confusions. We know for a fact that the brain will respond to this stimuli, whatever is coming through the mind, and that is because the brain is not the mind. The brain is an instrument of the mind itself. It is through the brain that the mind has the ability to give access to those memories, those Akashic records that in our case they are very recent, so that we can go back and see the connections of events, so that we can see the chains of causes and effects. And because the brain is just an instrument of the mind, the brain will always react to the stimuli that the mind is providing. So thoughts, they will generate reactions that we will be feeling at a physical level. Again, we don't confuse that with the senses. Because we may see an image and we may see the sounds associated to that image, but we're just not listening to them not with the ears of the flesh. We may see the image and its details, but we are not perceiving that with the eyes of the flesh. 
So whenever we are getting those reactions at a physical level, take those as important cues because behind every thought and behind every action, there is an ego who is present. And if that is the case, the moment that the brain is reacting to that, as you look, you will see that there has been an effect manifested in any one of the five cylinders of your human machine. So to look at this, and just as we spoke earlier on where do we start, and we decided we're going to hold on to either our anger or our pride or our lust, and we're going to work with it. So how do we focus then this observation? How is it that we put it to use in a way that is indeed useful for this practical effort? Well, we can rely then on the teachings of Emmanuel Kant in his third canon of thought where he states the exterior is a reflection of the interior. The chaos that we see outside of us is a reflection of our internal state. So there is nowhere else to go look for a change except within. And what this is telling us is that in our existence, there is an, a world that is internal and a world that is external. And in the external world, you and I can come together and we can hold different degrees of agreement on those things that we consider quote-unquote real. Because these are all transactions of the sensual minds of yours and of mine. And you and I may look at a table and you may say, table, and I would say, table and we would not give each other a thumbs up and we say agreement table that indeed is real but those level of agreement on reality they are very subjective <laughs> we tend to think that all of these things on the outside that these are the objective things but they are not because when it comes to the concept of reality relying in our senses we may both sit in the same room and I may think that it's cold while you may think that it's too warm. And yet we're both experiencing the same temperature. We may both be served the same dish. And for me, it may be perhaps a little bit too spicy. And for you, it may still be a little tame. So here in the external world, we rely on our senses and our senses as measuring devices, they carry error. So there is indeed subjectiveness. On the internal world, we, we then enjoy of our thoughts, of our ideas, of our emotions, of our longings. And our internal worlds seem to be disconnected from one another. And, never, and, and, and yet, we are all sharing that internal world while we are all submerged within the vast ocean of the mind. And we spend a lot of time during our day and we have mistakenly come to believe that we spend it in the external world. But we spend more time in our interior world than in the external. And nothing validates that more than a little bit of exercise of retrospection. And every time that we catch ourselves daydreaming, so if there is an external world and an internal world, then it becomes prudent that we embrace that hermetic principle of correspondence. The one that says, as above, so below. Because if the exterior is a reflection of our interior, then that means that we inside of us carry something that is known as an internal psychological city. And in our internal psychological city, there are peoples of all kinds. Just like in the outside, in our psychological city, there are good and there are bad neighborhoods. There are conditions of equality and favoritism. And there are also conditions of discrimination and inequality. They are, within our psychological city, places that you would be willing to visit time and time again. And at the same time, there are psychological places that you would rather stay away from. Dark areas within our mind that carry some memories, that fill us with shame, that bring fear, sorrow, 
in many cases, desperation. And if I can bring you back to the beginning where we were speaking about our temperaments and how is it that that is important, we have to understand how is it that our temperaments exercise magnetic pulls and how is it that we start attracting into our lives all of these things that are very similar to what we have within. Because all of these egos that exist in our subconsciousness, they do not ignore the psychological city. You know for a fact that you have some egos that are indeed very dark. And they know that they are dark. It is just that they do not know where they are. Within our psychological city, we have areas that seem to be friendly. Just like we have areas that tend to be treacherous and dangerous. And we then have to be very watchful of who we surround ourselves with. Because when we surround ourselves internally with those aspects that exist in those dark areas of our psychological city, the same thing starts manifesting outside. Because remember, the exterior is a reflection of the interior. So who we surround ourselves with is very important and that is something that we cannot discard. This law of universal magnetism is very prevalent throughout our lives and it manifests itself very strongly in that period where we're developing our personality between the ages of 14 and 21 years of age. And those of you who have teenager children, teenage children, you know for a fact that uh, it doesn't matter where you go, your kids will always figure out a way to get together with friends that always have the same bad habits. This is this law of universal magnetism. <laughs> this law that is also known as uh, the law of attraction. You see? And what happens is that egos attract themselves based on their psychological traits. If you start noticing egos in someone else, things that you feel that you should criticize and judge, the reason you are seeing those is because there are aspects within you that are magnetically attracting those aspects in someone else. We referred to that yesterday as the ideoplastic mirror of existence. And this is why we have to be very watchful before we start issuing judgment and criticism of others. And it's hard because we have made that a, a, a consideration that that is normal, that it is okay that we are humans, we make mistakes and then we make fun of things, etc. But, but that is indeed abnormal. Look, there may be a woman who appears virtuous. There may be a woman who appears to be honorable, exemplary wife. And during the day, she is respected and she is surrounded by people who appear to be virtuous and honorable and exemplary as well. We see them and we somehow feel like we must even bow to them of how great they seem to be. But in other times, within the dark aspects of her own psychological city, her egos may be those of lust. Her egos may be those of prostitution. And there will be times in which that is what will be surrounding her. And the same thing happens with a man. He may appear very honorable. And on the outside, people may respect him, think the very best of him. But in his psychological city, he also carries those aggregates of thievery, of extortion, of murder. And in different moments of the day and in their lives, they will be surrounded by that. Either because it is what we are seeing in the news or because it is what we are involving ourselves actively while we're trying to hide from everyone else. Our defects will attract themselves based on their psychological traits. And now that you know this, the moment that you go out there and you start seeing 
all of these things and others and now you're being more mindful you're going to be holding back on the judgment you're going to be holding back on the criticism and you're going to be giving this your very best shot to get from it what is known as the gift of lucifer <laughs> now this has to be adequately explained because we cannot be fanatical so allow me to ask you to open yourself to that which is known lucifer is the one that brings temptations and those temptations can be of many different kinds, all of which you have already experienced in this life and in many previous lives. Temptations that come with anger, that invite you to go out there and say something or do something against someone. Temptations that are associated to pride, where suddenly we feel like we are superior and something happens and then we feel like victims. And this internal tempter is guiding you to just fall into the trap. You see, temptations have to do with lust that at first appear in ways that are just very non-threatening. And before long, we identify, we fascinate, and as we fall into the sleep of consciousness, we end up making mistakes that are just abominable. So this tempting agent that exists within us it's the very same agent of temptation that we see when the great master was crucified. You would remember in the story of the great master at the cross to one side and another, there were two thieves. There was one thief that was considered a quote unquote good thief. His name was Agato. And the other one, the dark bad thief, his name was Kako. And Kako made an effort to tempt the great master even while he was hanging from the cross by telling him, aren't you supposed to be the savior? If you're the savior, save yourself. Save us. And just because of that, the great master Yeshua, he did not just get off the cross and brought them down and went on his way. He looked at him with kindness, with loving compassion. And as he did that, it was not even necessary for the internal savior to say something because Agato, as a representation of a positive value, he told him, don't speak like that to him. He said, forgive him. And then the great master directed his words to Agato, the positive value, by saying, I verily say unto you that today you and I will be in paradise. With his silence and his contemplation, what the great master is showing us is how is it that we need to steal the fire away from that temptation? That is what we have to do. When we refrain, we're effectively stealing away the fire from that temptation and we are making it available as spiritual energy for our own individual practice. So now that you know this, and as people come around and you know that you have the opportunity of refraining from those reactions, of remaining calm, serene, and observant, the moment that you set your eyes on any one of your targets, at that moment, you're going to start experiencing external forces that will go against you. These external forces are the forces of counter-transference. And you will see, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, at some point uh, you will feel that, that spontaneous urgency to just go out and do some mantras. And the personality will intervene and will say, ah, let's finish this conversation here in Facebook. <laughs> and you put the mantras for later and uh, you forget about them and then you don't do them. That is countertransference. You will say that you're going to make a change in your pride. And before long, people start praising you. How great you look. How wonderful you look. What are you eating? How come you look so young? And as you're trying to make an effort to get rid of those aggregates of pride, on the other side, there is a force that is trying to nourish them. That is the force of countertransference. 
So anytime that you embark on an effort to change, there will be external forces present to stop that. And those external forces will come to you because, again, our psychological aggregates have their own magnetic pulls. They will communicate with others in ways that are telepathic and that are below the radar of our intellect, and we will not detect that. And this is why, in the ancient teaching of Buddhism, they speak of the value of the three precious jewels. The three precious jewels are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha is the condition of illumination. It is that condition of an illuminated mind. And those of you who have gone deep into the books of Samael, you know very well that the moment that the practitioner is able to raise the serpent of fire in his mental body, the Divine Mother will be present at that moment of initiation and she will crown her son and her daughter, we're speaking in generic terms, as a Buddha. So Buddha is that illumination. The Dharma is the experience of the blissfulness of the innermost. Dharma is also many other things. But for our purposes, it is that heightened level of happiness that exists from reuniting the consciousness with the innermost itself because that by itself brings about phenomenal, positive, constructive, edifying consequences. And then, the Sangha. The Sangha is the school. The Sangha is the spiritual friends around us. You heard Samael say earlier, it is very important that we watch with who we get ourselves together with. We have to be very selective in our friends. Because all those who surround us, they make up that Sangha. And they come to us because we all share a similar level of being. That today, we may refer to it as the same level of morality. And the Sangha is very important. Because when we are experiencing the forces of counter-transference, the Sangha becomes for us a source of power, of guidance motivation, inspiration. Not because in the Sangha we are sharing with each other our astral experiences and speaking about this and about that, because we already spoke and we already made it clear that when we speak about these internal experiences, we may be evoking mistakenly envy and greed and stuff in others. <laughs> we, that, that, that is something that we don't need to be responsible for. There's no need for that. But we can find that extra breath of motivation within the people who surround us and they will help us be reminded of the teaching they will help us be reminded of the practice sometimes in ways that don't feel too amiable that we may be feeling that the people in the sun are barking at us and <laughs> that's okay they are still doing it in love and in kindness and this is why it is so important that we surround ourselves with the right people, whether it is here in the tangible or within the electronic artificial environment that has become the internet. We're sharing with you these beautiful squiggly lines on the screen because this is so real. And we bring about then the principle of correspondence again, as above, so below. And number two, the teaching from the third canon of thought the exterior is a reflection of the interior. Because what you are seeing here on the screen are notes that come from the thesis work of a man of name Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, he did phenomenal work in, in, in quantum electrodynamics back in the early 1940s. And he ended up receiving a Nobel Prize because of his work in quantum theory. And what he says in his thesis is the electrons, they cannot act on themselves. 
they can only act on other electrons. And the same thing happens to us. The other electrons are those people who are with us as part of the school, our spiritual friends, people who are seeking to make an internal transformation as well. This is also exactly why Samael tells us the mind is completely incapable of doing anything with the defects that exist within it. It will, it will rename them, it will hide them, it will justify them, but it cannot eliminate them. The electron cannot act on itself. We depend on a power superior to the mind internally. That is the power of our Divine Mother Kundalini because she is the igneous serpent of our magical powers. She is the one that when we are embracing the mystical death, she can then take of that flaming power that is sourced out of our own creative uh, sexual force and she can turn those defects into cosmic dust, but not the mind. And externally, when we are going through those difficult moments, we have to be very watchful of the internal conversation that we hold. Because that internal conservation, uh, conversation it will not be able to do much for us. It will not be able to help us act upon ourselves, except in ways that are favorable to the ego itself. Those other electrons, those friends, of the Sangha, they are the ones who can indeed truly help us to make a great change. So let's look at some examples of some of these defects. And we can start with the ego of vengeance. You see, the inferior aspects of these egos, they exist within our own psychological ghetto. And we all have egos of murder. We also have egos of, of, of pilferage and arson, uh, egos of addictions and misery. We all have them. And we know that we have them because it is very common for many of us to sit before the TV and enjoy these movies where the good guy is bringing havoc, destruction, and bloodshed to the bad guys. And we thrive on it. Those are our egos responding. When we find ourselves before the right causes and the right conditions, our egos, they will control our mind and they will control our heart. And you know this because every time that you have been moved by something like, for example, jealousy, jealousy invites all kinds of illogical thinking, things that are just preposterous, but they become very believable. And any love and kindness that could have existed in your heart, the moment that jealousy is present, that fades away and your heart becomes a black hole, cold, drawing energy out of the environment and people feel it. Because whenever you're around someone who is very jealous or whenever you're so around someone who is really angry, you can feel that there is a dense environment around them. So what happens with an ego of vengeance? Well, a man who could be a perfectly honorable man, great father, responsible at work, serviceable in the community. Under the right causes and conditions, this man can lose his mind. His emotional center can literally collapse and with that he can go and commit a crime, a murder, end up in jail. And the one thing that is necessary for us to be able to avoid these reactions that tend to happen in fractions of a moment is just to not identify ourselves with the circumstances. Because when we identify, we fascinate. And when we fascinate, we fall into the sleep of the consciousness. So let's keep in mind that our egos will always dictate the things that have to happen. They will try to always satisfy all of their commitments. And you know this, because whenever you feel eluded or hurt, there is something inside of you that tells you, don't stay quiet, say something. Whenever you feel attacked, Whenever you feel the victim of something, there is some dark aspect within us that, that whispers those dark words that say, you go show them. Who do they think they are? You've been wronged. And friends, Samael tells us we have to learn to walk the path of life. Knowing that the ego will do this, we have to become very skillful, stealing away that fire out of the ego. We have to be very selective 
in the friends that we are choosing because when we are not regardless of the work that we are doing the moment that we lower our guard we start regressing back into the average of everyone who surrounds us and we're speaking about the average relevant to our level of morality we start becoming more reasonable we lose perspective of that balance between mercy and justice so at, before all we have to limit our associations with people who are perverse people who are ill-intended we don't have to go out there and convert them but we have to behave in ways that are honorable so that it is our actions the one who demonstrate the ones that demonstrate the changes that must be taking place in each and every one of us so as you have seen throughout this lecture we have been making a reference to both the positive values and the negative values and at the end of the day we have to eliminate from ourselves both the positive and the negative because even moved by our positive values in many instances we have said things that have resulted in ways that we did not anticipate many times throughout our lives we have created chaos inadvertently we have we hoped to see something happen and that is not what happened and that is all based on our own positive values so we must be watchful like the overwatch at the time of war because as we start being selective not because we are discriminating but selective because we're seeking to create relationships that are edifying and dignifying we may come across many who appear to be anchorites who appear to be pietistic and as we observe of their actions because it has been written you will know the tree by its fruit we will come to see that many of them are just illustrated ignorances they seem to have the gift of wisdom but they are not nothing more than a walking library of a very high horsepower intellect they will come and offer advice and tell you how to do things and in reality they are not psychologists they know what they have seen in the books but their intentions would be hidden and before long you find yourself in difficulties that are truly unnecessary and as we use those difficult moments to well make the most of them and comprehend our defects and observe them and work with our divine mother to eliminate them there would be many difficult circumstances that become unnecessary because there has been a third person that is not immediately evident behind it because you see delinquency dresses itself sometimes in sainthood remember that within the psychological city of everyone there are prostitutes there are murderers there are thieves and just because somebody appears to be something we cannot just be blind and accept it we always have to be very watchful and we see this example in the lives of many saints because many saints suffer tremendously because of all of these hidden aggregates we have for example the temptations of saint anthony and what we're seeing here is a beautiful artistic rendition of michelangelo where we see saint anthony being tormented by his own temptations there are many other beautiful paintings where saint anthony is just raising his eyes and his arms to heaven and he is claiming for mercy and for liberation and yet the temptations are around him not as these terrifying creatures but as beautiful lustful women who are holding him down bound onto the earth not letting him reach the higher realms of consciousness just like saint anthony many other saints they lived in penance 
And in the meantime, they battle terribly within themselves, within their own psychological cities, and they fought their internal prostitutions and their internal debaucheries. And they went through fasting and penance, and they went through acts of mortification, and they committed self-flagellation, and they tortured their flesh to be able to eradicate these defects. But none of that worked. Today we suffer tremendously because of these defects that we just don't see except through the daily interaction with others. And until we make a deliberate change, when we, until the moment that we define ourselves and what is it that we're going to do, we're just going to keep walking through life begging for mercy, asking the heavens to liberate us from our suffering, making promises that we are going to continue to forget. And the sad part is that as many students start building their faith, and they go through their faith of clarity, and they start adding the practice, and they start building their faith, and they can give testimony of how well all of this works in their lives. They lose sight if they continue identifying they will put this treasure of wisdom aside and as an alternative what they will do is gravitate to the many solutions that are offered by the many religions that are out there and there is nothing wrong with seeking shelter within the wisdom of the world's great religions the problem exists in the fact that these solutions offered by religions, they have been severely misunderstood. The psychological aggregates of laziness have done tremendous tricks within the mind because of what they see as convenient. And today, it has gotten to the point that when we speak of faith, in many minds, what we see reflected is a synonym of hope. In many minds, what we see when people hear the word faith is just the, the, the mental creation of, of an anticipation of something that is going to be good, something that is going to happen in the future, not now, but that eventually will be good for me. Today, faith is even confused with the concept of a promise. We cannot blame, we don't blame anybody for this. But what history has shown is that this is the effect of many religious leaders back since the 15th century when the expansion of Christianity was forced throughout the world. You see? As we gave our lecture yesterday, we shared that ancient Buddhist teaching in which the Buddhist masters say, we don't live for this life. We're living this life for the next one. And in consideration of that, Samael tells us that what continues after death is our legion. What continues after that moment of death, returning into a new womb in the next life, is our collective of our values, the positive and the negative ones. Depending on the group, the school, or the religion that you are, those same values that are all associated with our resentments and with our desires and our gluttonies, etc. They would refer to them as ghosts of evil omens. In Buddhism, they refer to those as hungry ghosts, you see? This is the one thing that continues to return. There is no future for the personality. We all know by now that the personality will go with the physical body to whatever its final destination is, and eventually it will disintegrate. As, a, as an energetic source, it will dissipate. What continues after death is our legion. And we cannot rely on false hopes, on a false sense of security because of something that has been misunderstood for so many years. And the great master Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. 
the great master is giving a very profound Gnostic teaching. Because when he is saying, let him deny himself, that is the same as the second factor of the revolution of the consciousness. Denying of ourselves is the mystical death. It's the non-acceptance of our inferior nature, of all of those characters that exist within our psychological city, so that we can work with our Divine Mother towards eliminating them, so that we can free up the consciousness, because by now we know that that is indeed the core of our work. When he says, take up your cross, he is inviting us to be born once again. And in this case, it's exactly as he said to Nicodemus when he said, we have to be born again of fire and water. Because in the union of that super dynamic of love, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the water of our creative power and our consciousness, they liberate us. And last, he says, follow me. That doesn't mean to walk after him. He's not referring to a, a mental idea of a caravan of people. Of course not. Follow me means imitate what I have done. Because we are all imitatus. Do as I do. Meaning sacrifice for others. The three factors of the revolution of the consciousness are right here. All of Samael's books, all 78 of them, all the hundreds of hours of lectures, and the thousands of pages that emerged out of his Christmas messages and his congresses, they all have to do with this single sentence that the great Master Jesus shared with us. We have to be born again, we have to die within, and we are here to sacrifice for others. And it is in that process of being born again, out of the magic that exists behind the power of the cross, that is the only way back into that Garden of Eden that Moses spoke of in Genesis. So friends, if you are here and you have received the stove of wisdom, Make the most of it. Don't think that if you leave, that you're going to go get somewhere where somebody is going to solve all of your problems. Where the sacrifice of one great master will take care of erasing each and every mistake that you have made. Because at the end of the day, all of our actions will go into that scale of justice. And if we have not sacrificed ourselves for others, if we have not made a sincere effort to eliminate from us those things that bring so much suffering to us and everyone else, if we don't seek to be born again of fire, water, and spirit, then nothing will change. And we will just continue. Dear friends, the essence comes to us from within the realm of beauty. And Tiferet in the Tree of Life means exactly that, beauty. Our essence descends to us from the realm of the human soul of the innermost. And you have already heard that it descends to us directly from the starts. The focus of our work is for us to liberate the consciousness. And we have to liberate the consciousness of its bad company. And the bad company of the consciousness are all of those creatures that exist within our own psychological city. All of those that are trapped within the psychologic, psychological ghetto of perdition and our consciousness is trapped inside of them. So we have to make use of our magnetic center. And we know that it is active because if we are here, it is because our magnetic center is active. But the thing is, is that we have incorrectly placed our false personality in that magnetic center. And we have to shift that. We have to return our consciousness. We have to return that magnetic center into our consciousness so that we can slowly, by virtue of the elimination of our defects, that we can create a permanent center of consciousness per se. We have 
to initiate the path of the realized man. That is the internal change that invites us to take the vertical path of life, the one that takes us into higher levels of being time and time again. We have to be able to embrace the progressive didactic of Gnosis. Because what you will see is that as you come back into the teaching, as in when you go and you reread a book or a passage, all of a sudden you realize that it said more than what you had originally grasped. And that is part of that progressive didactic. The more awakened the consciousness, the more capable it is of apprehending the wisdom that we have received. And as a consequence, well, our level of being will start changing. As it continues making a progression, we continue going through different tests in life. We continue going through tribulations and the problems of life. But we become more capable of dealing with them. We become more emotionally stable. Our quickness of thought becomes more apparent, more apparent. And as that happens, we're not constantly reacting. We adapt better to the circumstances. We start living a life that is more honorable. So if you ever have any doubt on, on, on the efficacy of your magnetic scent, if you ever have any doubt on, on the quality or progression of your work, in the difficult circumstances, before you react, ask yourself, is this, that thought, that emotion, that action you're going to take, is this honorable? Because the word honorable explains it perfectly. And if it is, then you will see that there is an internal sensation of satisfaction. There is an internal sensation of gratification, even in the midst of the chaos. And we can continue moving on. But let's not forget about this universal law of magnetism, the so-called law of attraction. The one who creates the influence behind this cosmic force is Archangel Uriel. And Uriel is the light of God. That light is indeed the love of God. And Uriel is responsible for all things that have to do with love and affinity. So if today, <laughs> in your magnetic center, if you are a merchant, well, you will see that as a merchant, you move very well in those circles that have to do with trades and markets and buyers and, 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 and selling, and that you will attract that to yourself. If your magnetic center that today we have, center around the personality, if it is very scientific, you will be uh, very attracted to books and papers and experiments and theories and intellect. But now that we understand that, know that uh, the ego has taken the personality and the personality is at the service of the ego. Our goal is to make our personality, our physicality, to become ourselves in a totality, a fine and delicate instrument at the service of the innermost. But until that happens, the ego assumes ownership of the human machine and thus of the personality itself. So don't forget about the benefit of the Sangha, because when the egos of lust are present, then we start attracting inferior sexuality. We start attracting the flirting, the temptations, the lasciviousness, the adultery. When the egos are drinking, when they are the ones that are present, what we start seeing is that we start attracting all of that. So, if we're then talking about all this, and now we know about our psychological city and the effect of the magnetic effect of these egos and the dangers that we are facing and how is it that we need to become very agile stealing this fire from the the internal source of temptation then we have to ask our question which is where are we and that is important even at this very same moment because when it comes to Gnosis, we seem to be listening until something inside of you tells you, I already know that. And the moment that happens, we start taking shelter within the depths of our psychological city. And it should be of no surprise if all of a sudden you realize that uh, even though you're listening to this Gnostic lecture, you're playing with your phone. Or you're distracted, <laughs> looking at something else. 
because this is part of all of that force of counter-transference. So when it comes to where are we, how about right now? It is likely that you may say, well, I'm here, I'm listening. <laughs> More so now that we have brought this to our attention, of course I'm listening. But we have to be very watchful about the contradictions of the mind. We have to be watchful about the projections of our own defects. All of these things lure us into distractions. And the moment that we get distracted, then who is the one listening? Is it the personality or the physical body? Which one is then the aggregate that is stealing those units of attention? And you see, we cannot continue to afford to see our creative power wasted in those ways. We have to learn to focus our consciousness. So when we say focus your consciousness, I want you to start thinking in terms of a spotlight. Because that is a very beautiful analogy on how is it that we want to focus our consciousness. We have to learn to adequately set the consciousness where the consciousness must be set. And if you, and those of you who have read some else books, you will know this very well. It is very common to see that he repeats things over and over and over and over and over again to the point that many students say, why does he keep saying this? I get it. And we understand that you get it. The thing is that he is speaking to the intellect so that he can saturate it. So that when he releases the teaching, that the teaching can go straight into the consciousness. That is the whole intent. We have to learn to adequately set the consciousness where the, where the consciousness must be, must be set. You know, if we are listening to this lecture, in the meantime, uh, we stop and we're thinking about the, the coronavirus. Or in the meantime, we're thinking about enjoying a cup of wine. Or if we're thinking about buying groceries, <laughs> then in reality, we are not here. And Samayo tells us, we are wherever our consciousness is. So if you're driving your car and you're thinking about buying groceries, then you're at the market. And it is your body that has been so well trained, the one responsible driving the vehicle. If you're trying to have a conversation with your wife, but you are caught in fear. If you're trying to have a crucial conversation, but you're worried about your values or your, your, your pride and your integrity and everything else, then you are trapped within your psychological city. You are not there to be able to exercise the, 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 the righteous actions that must be taken. So remember the words of Samaya. Behind every thought and behind every action, there is an ego. So look at this exercise. Follow us here for a second and join us. <clears throat> Excuse me, in this particular mental exercise because you will see what exactly we are referring to when it comes to the idea of focusing the consciousness. And let's use wine as an example. I would love just to do a quick a, a, a quick survey and say, "Hey, who likes wine?" I don't drink wine, but it's very common for people to love wine these days. So let's go ahead and use wine as an example. So if you happen to be thinking about wine, and in your thoughts, what you have been seeing is something like science says that wine is healthy. Wine is actually good for you. It helps you with your blood pressure. It allows you to sleep better at night. We have to ask ourselves, what is the aggregate that is thinking on that? And it is likely that you will find a drunkard ego of pride toying with your intellectual center. This is interesting. It is likely that you're caught in the thinking about wine and you say, oh, I've got to get a couple of bottles. We're running low. Those thoughts, so subtle, so common. Who's thinking that? Well, it is likely that there is a drunkard ego of gluttony. That is toying within your motor center. Notice this. That voracious appetite of gluttony. Where there is no limit to how much it can consume. Well, I'm running low. I must satisfy the inventory. <laughs> I must get moving and go get something else. See how it affects that motor center? Look, for example. I, I think I need a couple of cups of wine to ease off so that I can relax. So that I can you know, just take the edge off. So that I can have a good time. That could be the drunkard ego of lust. 
toying with your emotional center. Behind every thought and behind every action, there is an ego. And every ego is associated with one of the five cylinders of the human machine. They will affect your thoughts, your emotions, your habits, your sexual impulses, and your instincts. And yes, we say the drunkard ego of lust and the drunkard ego of gluttony and the drunkard ego of pride, even though these are all different defects, all of these defects, they are very, they are very proficient in their dramatizations. And they exist in these ways. This is how in our exercises of self-reflection and meditation, how is it that we have to start focusing our consciousness like a spotlight so that we can adequately see it? And the moment that we see them, as we comprehend them, we have to sit those defects in the bench of the accused. And we don't have to create this mental drama where we are a lawyer and we are pointing our finger and accusing it. No. What this means is that we have to understand the effect that these egos have in us. And once we have that comprehension, dear friends, just invoke of the flaming power of your Divine Mother. And you will see how these egos start becoming weaker and weaker until they disappear. But there's one takeaway from this mental exercise. Notice how those temptations, they were never threatening. And this is the way that the ego operates. It is something always very subtle. And it will lure you in ways that if you're not watchful before you realize, you are deep in trouble. And so... We have to be like the overwatch at the time of war. Remember, observation, comprehension, and elimination. The awakening of the consciousness and all of this work, it brings about a perfect balance into the psyche. The moment that we are capable of start focusing our consciousness, the light of the consciousness itself is what is going to bring everything into its rightful place. And slowly... But surely, you will see that your intimate conflicts, all of them, start becoming resolved. Self-observation is the action of bringing the light of the consciousness into our darkness. And friends, the consciousness is just a marvelous gift. We just have to learn to use it wisely. Dear friends, we were able to source the material for these teachings from Samael's very own work. The Revolutionary Psychology, his book on the Great Rebellion, The Fundamentals of Gnostic Education, The Color of the Buddha, and The Revolution of the Dialectic. And we're otherwise noted, <laughs> unless otherwise noted, these are the sources out of which we got our images to put this material together for you. So dear friends, we surely hope that this has been useful and that you can bring this into your daily practice. This has been part two on the science of self-discovery. Tonight we covered where are we and developing the sense of psychological self-observation. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And may all beings be happy.